So, who here wants to make money from their games? Yeah, pretty much everybody, right? And there's always a fallacy that people like to put things into the store just because you know, they like doing things. And I'm sure some developers out there, you know, like to show that they're great developers and release some, some free stuff. But ultimately, I'm hoping you're going to say this, that everyone wants to make money and you're going to show these lovely people how to retire rich and soon. I will try. I will try. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I, my name is Paul Flanagan. I'm an advisor to Creative Mobile. I'll describe them in a sec. Just going back to what the um, previous speaker was saying about the whole freemium model. This is what this company does, does freemium. And I, I take your point about not um, users don't like um, having to um, pay to win. I mean, you can really screw up your whole game if you sort it out that way. But um, let me tell you a bit about Creative Mobile. So it started four years ago. There were three guys who were working in Tallinn in Estonia, and they were working for a Canadian game developer. And this game developer shut down the studio. So they, were, they had um, no jobs, no money, no connections, and um, they're kind of scratching their heads thinking, what, what should they do? And they're in Eastern Europe, you know, in, uh, in the Baltics. And at that stage, it was tough to get iPhones where they were, and they didn't have the money to buy them anyway. Um, but they found a handset called the Motorola Milestone. Does anybody remember that handset? I had one of those too. So it's kind of a clunky thing, but it was Android. And they decided to take a bet on that. They thought, um, the thinking really was that um, you know, this potentially could be big and there's probably not a lot of competition there, so let's try to do something. So what they did was they experimented with lots of, of different games. So th their, their approach was to do a bunch of casual games. And even today, you look at a lot of big publishers, they're doing the same thing, just um, always iterating, new things coming out all the time. So they did um, a couple, which went absolutely nowhere. They're running out of money. And they finally had success with um, a basketball game. It was a basketball shooting game. It's called Basketball Shots 3D. And it's still on, on Google Play. So that was an ad-supported game. And they had enough money to, um, to keep them going, at least. And then they did another game, which transformed things. And this game was called Drag Racing. Um, maybe you guys have played it. It's, it's perennially be close to the top of the free charts in the racing category. Um, all around the world, and it really transformed things. So um, four years later, they've done over 200 million downloads, staffed up to 85 people. The company's profitable. They've, they haven't raised any money. Um, now, one thing that has changed is that they have the strategy of doing lots of casual games. So I've been working with them for a couple of years, and my advice to them was focus on the IP that's already successful, drag racing. Because if you look at Rovio, you know, we all know the story of Rovio, but sometimes you don't think of what they did after success. You know, we all know that they had 52 or 53 games to begin with, and finally they hit Angry Birds. Now, how much new IP has Rovio created since then? And they haven't actually created any. It's all been extensions of Angry Birds. So Kai Head, who's the majority shareholder, he he and his you know, team, they said, look, it's tough to create hit games. Let's focus on what we've got. Now, they've got a publishing arm, but internally, their focus is on Angry Birds. Same thing in Creative Mobile. The internal studio is now just focused on racing games. And I'll, I'll run you through some of the other examples. But there's a publishing arm which does other genres. So drag racing, it's... So what I want to do, as, as I was introduced, is, was to talk about how to make money doing this stuff. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do it, but there's some quite good lessons by going through how Creative Mobile has approached it, and we can, we can explore that. They were lucky in that they chose the right market at the right time, and they were in early. And drag racing, is, it's a good game, and it's always been close to the top of the charts. There have been times when it's had organic downloads around 300,000 a day. Right time of year, uh, maybe they're doing a promotion. Now, you know, three years later, it's still 100,000 a day, which shows the power of the charts. And this is just on, on Android. 
but it's been around three years and it's got a very passionate community around it and you know how did it last for three years so it's maybe worthwhile taking a look at some of the game mechanics it's very simple when the lights go all you've got to do is shift gears that's it and then you earn some money and then you um, can buy parts upgrade the vehicle race it again win a series, buy another car, and, and, and on and on. When you get into this part of it, the tuning part, it's actually quite addictive. And people spend a lot of time doing it. And it's also got quite deep gameplay in that, you know, you guys are probably familiar with CSR racing, so it's the same kind of thing. This came before CSR, though. Now, what this has is some further levels of depth where you can change gear ratios or um, add or um, alter nitro, um, nitrous oxide duration. And these things have an impact on, uh, on how well the car performs. So it's actually quite deep. So given the way the market's going these days, you know, you've got choices. Is it casual or do you go mid-core, do you go hardcore? This game, at, at one level, it's very casual. But if you look at the people behind it, um, sort of the users who are playing it on and on, they're really getting into the, the complexity. So I think there's, there's something to be said for that. So these are um, just some, some, some metrics around it. We're running about um, a million D DAU for this, this single title. People tend to play it a lot during the day. Um, metrics, you know, some of the previous speakers have been talking about metrics that are built into you know, or, you know, how they're doing business, absolutely critical. We've got a team which just focuses on user behavior, you know, A-B testing. Um, we do this for our own games, for published games, and you've really, really got to dig in. Um, if we look at the audience, this is just, you know, age distribution across one day of, of downloads. You know, we've got a lot of teenagers playing it, which you kind of expect from a casual game, but 18 to 24, 23 to 34, 35 to 54. You know, you've probably got a lot of people like me or people older than you who are playing this because um, it, it kind of works. So it's not just on um, the kids' game. And in terms of geography, so the studio is based right here in the Baltics. You know, Estonia has got a population of about 3 million, and a third of their market is in the United States. Kind of makes sense because it's, it's drag racing and that, that kind of fits into you know, the, the American worldview, um, but just goes to show the reach that you can get through these app stores. We also have um, a really good user base in Europe and Russia, because we have a localized for Russia. Asia, we're almost nowhere. That 20% really reflects Malaysia, Philippines, you know, those markets where you got lots of downloads, no monetization. At the beginning of the year, we had a good think about where we wanted to grow the business, and it was China, Korea, and Japan. And if any of you went to uh, Pocket Gamer Connects at the beginning of this year, you could see that you know, Chris James brought in a lot of people from that part of the world who were talking about their markets. And these are the biggest markets in the world now. And where are we? We're absolutely nowhere. You know, we, we were distributing in China, but um, we didn't get the localization right, we didn't have the right partner. Um, and with our new titles, we're looking to fix that. But if you're looking to get your games out there, think of those markets, would be my advice. Just going on to how we, how we maintain the position of the game in the charts and the stores. Um, you know, you, you've only got so many marketing opportunities in the App Store. You can put in videos, you can put in stills. Um, the icon is critically important, and we've evolved the imagery over time um, and changed the, the vehicle icon quite a few times and found the ones that worked, and they make a big difference. So let's go back and look at you know, the core IP. So the basic game, drag racing, it's all about sports cars. And that could be anything from Lamborghinis through Ferraris to um, uh, Dodge Chargers and kind of American muscle cars. Now, one way to, 
to expand is to go into you know kind of parallel or uh, yeah parallel market. So we've done a, a bike racing edition of it, and we've done a four by four edition. You know, so SUVs. They've done across iOS and Android maybe 20, 25 million downloads each, uh, which is respectable. You know, not as big as as drag racing. But one of the things it allowed us to do was to upgrade the engine. So the original drag racing was an ad-supported game, written in Java, um, and we retrofitted in-app payments to it. And really, if you look at it, you'll see it's done in a really weird way. Um, you know, going back to the previous point about not allowing uh, people to pay to win, we could have structured it in such a way that people can just buy cash, buy kind of the gold equivalent, get the top car, tune it, and race it. But we didn't do that because there's a multiplayer component, kind of a real-time multiplayer. And we might have made money in the short term, but in the longer term, we probably would have alienated the core group, and then we would have lost you know, the chart position and, and the people who were supporting it. Anyway. We were able to experiment with new ways of monetizing in first off bike edition and secondly four by four. And if we look at the amount of money we make from those titles, um, you know, per download or per user, it's probably two or three times as much. You know, the mechanics are fundamentally similar, but it's just been tuned better to give people kind of the right stuff for the right time. Just while we're on the subject of in-app payments. Another thing we've did, we did with drag racing to try to up its monetization rate is, is allow people to buy packs at the beginning. You know, there are lots of tricks you can do, but one is, you know, you're at level two, you're not getting forward in the racing, and then you give somebody an offer. Give them an offer of, you know, a better car, tuned up, and enough RPs to upgrade it. And um, that has, you know, incrementally increased the return by probably about 10, 20 percent. Nitro Nation is our um, latest brand, and I'll explain that a bit more later. Um, let's just go next. One way to drive downloads and also usage is to run special events and competitions. So I think it was Christmas last year for drag racing. We ran this, comp we ran, um, this competition down here, and downloads on, on the uh, when we were running it, doubled from like 100 to 200,000. And in some ways it's just incredible that you know you can just run a competition on your app page and get that much of an impact, which you can. There are that many people who are looking through and who will come across things. And within the games we do cross promotion. So we say, you know, you can in this game here it might be saying um, download this game and there'll be this thing going on. But users really respond to these things. And we give away Anything from gold through to new cars. And it's, it's, it's surprising what people will, will do. We make pretty extensive um, use of Facebook. So I think the initial, this presentation, its initial form was done um, for you know, PG Connects um, in, in January. And we had about 2 million Facebook fans. So now we got you know, 2.9 million Facebook fans. And people are quite happy to sign up. You know, if they're kind of interested in the game, you know, they want news. And we're giving them the option to um, choose new cars that are coming through or new packs or, or give us their feedback. We also use Facebook for user acquisition, but I'll touch on that in, um, in a later slide. You know, I've mentioned a few times that we have a fairly hardcore user group. And one of those users, one of the users set up something called Drag Racing Forums, which we're, we're now administering. But if you go online, you'll see that there are lots and lots of threads about how to tune your Ford Escort RS2000. And uh, people are you know, really into it. So it's worth encouraging this type of behavior. And um, in, in whatever way, which is maybe giving prizes or official marketing support. YouTube. Historically, it's been a repository for user-made videos. You know, if, if you think about what drag racing is about, it's like getting the ultimate tune, winning a race, and then you know, you've won. 
hopefully. And um, what you should, what you really want is um, every play or you know that kind of functionality where user can say, "Look, we just did. I just did this and, and post it to Facebook." Now, every play has to work on Android. We can really do it. It wasn't worthwhile doing it on iOS because you don't have as, as big a base there. So if you go on YouTube and do a search on drag racing or do a search on um, you know, a Venom or high-end car drag racing, you'll just see videos after video, video after video of um, user-based stuff where they basically show their car, their tune, the race, and the victory. And so that made us think YouTube, you know, quite good. But what we're finding at the moment now is that, um, you know, obviously you're probably more familiar than I am with Twitch and, and other channels. Um, you can do an enormous amount of useful promotion through this. So we used to do basically in-app marketing, and then we started doing stuff on the forums and Facebook, and now most of our effort is focused on YouTube. It's putting videos up there. Um, like Not Your Nation, which I'll show you later, we've put down a lot of videos about the making of, put it in there. People are, are quite keen to see this stuff. So YouTube is extremely um, useful. So again, again, continuing on the theme of how you get your game out there and how you get the volume up, people often talk about featuring. You know, how do you get your game featured? And we've, we've made a lot of effort in, in managing and developing the relationships with Google, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon. You know, it's, it's been made easy by the fact that the game was already successful. So when I started working with Creative Mobile two years ago, they had probably done 100 million plus downloads. And we're probably one of the most popular games on um, Google Play, but they had no contact with Google. That's what happened. I knew some people at Google, made the connection. We went to Mountain View, met the people. Kind of, but two years ago, Google had a tiny developer relations team. There were three people. There's Bob Meese based in San Francisco, there's a guy in Asia, and there's another guy um, in San Francisco. At the time, Apple, they had probably around 30 or 40 people in developer relations. You know, much, much more hands-on. Um, the way we got in touch with Apple was there's this guy called Dave Cockle. He's on LinkedIn. Um, I understood that he was working in Eastern Europe, so I just sent, sent him an in-mail. And you know, to his credit, he responded, and we kind of met up at GDC or Gamescom, something like that. So featuring, it's important. Yeah, I think it was probably more important in the past. In the past, it was make or break. These days, featuring tends not to last as long. The, um, you know, the app stores are, are busier and more segmented. Um, so it's not you know do or die getting it, but it's possible to build relationships with these people. And the way to do it is to go to events like PG Connect um, or Gamescom and try connecting with them through LinkedIn. What they're really interested in is good games, and especially good games which leverage their platforms. Apple is particularly interested in exclusivity. But they're also interested in games which leverage the platform. So, you know, the um, you know, game center type stuff, that kind of functionality. If you take advantage of that, then it could be interesting. Microsoft, I mean, to Microsoft's credit these days, you know, they, they're trying really hard. And um, they've got enough market share to be interesting. Um, Amazon is probably, you know, in the same boat. Oculus Rift, we've tried doing stuff with Oculus Rift. Um, has anybody here done any stuff with Oculus? Have they created any demos? A few? Yeah, a bit trying. Yeah. Amazing kit. Um, hard to get their attention. And I think they're just trying to manage growth and they have so many opportunities on the plate. So if, if they don't respond, then I wouldn't get angry at them because I just think they're having to prioritize really hard. Um, but that thing which works on the Samsung handset, I tried that at developing summer, I was pretty impressed. Um, now if you look at companies like Samsung, Lenovo, you know, they have their own app stores, there are opportunities with them, they will do promotions, again, exclusivity is something they like to have. Um, some of them will still, still do preloads. It might not be the actual game on there, but they've got their own um, 
you know, virtual store, which will at least have, have shortcuts to your game. So, you know, possibly worth looking at. And Mozilla and Intel, similar, you know, depending what your game is and the market. Okay, let's, um, let's take a closer look at modernization. So, we're talking, I was talking about um, in-app purchases earlier. And Drag Race has started out as an ad-supported game. And if you, if you look at it now, you see we, we're throwing everything at it. Because the in-app is, is kind of not well designed. You know, we're not making as much money as we should. And what, I remember reading this um, a review on the App Store. And a user said, why won't you take my money? He, he literally he just wanted to spend a lot of money, get the best cars, and win the races. And, you know, they will pay. Um, and, but we weren't making it easy. But, so the best thing we could do for our kind of competitive based game is just monetize it through ads as much as possible. So we've got banners across the top, we've got interstitials between screens, we've got video videos, we have offer walls, and you know, makes um, makes a good chunk of money. Probably not as good as a pure IAP game, but you know, you're monetizing users who are not going to buy stuff anyway. Personally, as a as a user, I like offer walls. You know, sure, I'll download something um, if it's going to give me that gold because I don't want to spend money on it. One thing about using them, though, is it complicates your analysis of the value of your virtual currency. So, um, in our, our latest game, Natural Nation, we don't use any of these. Actually, we're just using IP. We're just trying to tune the whole thing and work out who's buying what, when, and where, why. And if when you start putting offer walls in, you start skewing incentives, and it's not quite clear maybe what's working or what's not. But as you can see, we work with quite a few different suppliers. And if any of you go to any trade show, you're going to meet lots of salespeople for these suppliers. So the, um, the gentleman who won at Apps World, you know, with his, um, his, his game, I, had, I went up and spoke to one developer just to see what they're up to. And his first question was, you're not selling ads, are you? <laughs> I said, nope, no, not doing um, So, you know, it, it must be that the ad company is making an enormous amount of money if they've got so many salespeople are selling this stuff. Um, but, so anyway, with Creative Mobile, we're in a position where we've got several fairly high volume games, and we can, um, we can test stuff in different markets at different times. So that's why we've got so many. Um, but it's also the case that one might, one might perform really well one month or one genre or one market, and you take your eye off it, and then next month you've had a spike in usage, but no money because they didn't fill it. So it's actually quite complicated to, um, uh, to, to manage. So we created our own platform. Um, you might be familiar with a company called Mopub. Mopub did the same thing. They got bought by Twitter for some large amount of money. But we created our own monetization platform. Um, it's got a mediation layer, um, connects to about 15 different ad networks, and real-time bidding in. So anytime there's an opportunity for an ad, it just pulls, and we get the highest um, paying ad in the game. And it's, it's meant an incrementally improved um, bottom line from ads. And with our published titles, we use this as well. Um, so if you guys have, if you're looking for this kind of solution, talk to me afterwards, I'll introduce you to the guys who are, um, who are selling this. So this is our latest title, Nitro Nation. And if we look at the App Store these days, you know, which, which games are dominant? Now, we know which ones they are, and, what, and they're not just supported by massive user acquisition budgets. They might have massive user acquisition budgets, but how can they afford it? They can afford it because they're, they've got a very high lifetime value. Drag racing, and even 4x4 and bike edition, they didn't have a particularly high lifetime value. All those ad networks I was showing you earlier, you know, you could use all of those, or we could have used all those for user acquisition, but it didn't because um, it didn't pay. You know, one, two, three dollars a user. You know, you look at the conversion rate, it just didn't work out. So the idea with Nitro Nation was to create something which was deep enough that you got a high lifetime value. 
so that you could afford to buy user. So I mentioned um, CSR Racing earlier. CSR Racing kind of came after drag racing and had you know, beautiful console um, quality graphics on top of kind of a similar mechanic. So Metro Nation has kind of done a similar leapfrog. I mean, it looks, looks great, but it's, it's actually, it's, a, it's been a real stretch for the studio. We released it in beta over a year ago, uh, about a year and a half ago. It didn't go into you know production release until the second of April, and it's it's in it's in a continual development cycle. We haven't even had 1.0 yet. We've probably had that in about three or four months. But it's all about it's it's effectively an, an MMOG. It's an RPG, um, and it's complicated, and it's probably almost too complicated for the studio. But you know they're pushing the envelope. And this is what's pretty going to make or break the company, if this thing really succeeds. But the core thing really is a LTV. And as I said earlier, we're not there. No, there's no advertising, no offer walls. We're just working on the core loop, and then the on ramp. So early on, the core loop worked. When users got in there, they would spend money. They spend good chunks of money. But the on ramp is terrible. You know, we. People would come in and they just walk away right away. They just wouldn't get into it. So we spent a lot of time uh, focusing on that. And it seems kind of obvious, but um, you know, there's, there's absolutely no use paying for marketing or promotion or user acquisition unless you got that on ramp and the loop working. The whole engine has to be working. So not last year, but the year before, we went to Gamescom to. Um, set up a booth and invited all of our users um, and trade partners, and, um, channel partners, to come and check out the game. So this was when the game was in an alpha state. Now, a couple of speakers before have been talking about the need to, to iterate, to get user feedback, and that's exactly what this is about. We brought our producers here. And we had our producers standing behind users, watching them play the game. And they were pulling their hair out because you know, someone had the thing, it was obvious. The next thing to do is press this button to go back to the previous screen, and they just wouldn't get it. You'd have to interview and say, well, you actually need to press this button. You know, it wasn't the users, it was the game. And very, very useful to get in front. So we had thousands of people coming through, and you know, if they played, they got a free hot dog, I think, and we had a competition for a, to drive Lamborghini at the end of the day. Not that expensive, and very, very useful. And as I go around trade shows in Europe, like Casual Connect or things like that, you can see in the core of all of them, there are just kind of like an indie area. And in some cases, there are, you know, it costs nothing to go to it. And it's a great way to meet people and potentially, you know, partners and whatnot. How about 34 minutes? Almost done. I've got a trailer, but I'll cut that because I'm running out of time. Um, Final thing to talk about is, is publishing. So this is the way that we can make more money for ourselves, in that you know, the core studio is looking at drag racing. But one of the problems we have is that we have an enormous number of downloads. So how do we, how do we monetize those downloads? You know, drag racing is 100,000 a day, and monetize it OK, but you know, not as well as it should. Um, and yeah, we can cross promote um, you know, Clash of Clans or other games. Um, we make, make money from that, but fundamentally better to cross promote our own games or games which we're publishing. So if you guys are interested in talking to a publisher, let's chat afterwards. It's the, the way we approach it is um, show us a game, we'll give you feedback on, on design, monetization, throw a couple hundred thousand users at it and see how it goes and then put it through the analytics engine. And if it works, then we'll do a deal and guarantee at least a million players. So that's, that is the approach. So the other thing which the blurb said, I got a minute now, was um, we could talk about investment and the exit. So Creative Mobile's in, if you look at where it stands in the App Store, 
you've got a number of other pretty clear competitors, CSR Racing, <coughs> Racing Rivals, um, Fast and Furious 6. So the owners of, or the publishers, developers of all of those titles have either been acquired for a large chunk of money or received large investment at a very high valuation. So when I said earlier that it all rides on this, it's really coming down to a good title that monetizes and which we can get in the market. And that is going to help us to go to the next stage of potentially getting in um, investment or exits. I'm fairly well versed on, I've got a background in, in venture capital, so I'm fairly well versed on um, you know, that side of it. I know in the UK there are a lot of resources for um, earlier stage and seed funding, and many more than there were just a few years ago. Um, so if anybody wants to talk about either of those, please chat to me afterwards. Thank you.